first time, welcome to the NAS. For everybody else, hey, how's it going? Good to see you guys. Um, my name is Joe, the youth director here at the NAS. Uh, for all of you people joining on live stream and TV, how's it going? Uh, camera adds 15 pounds, remember. <laughs> What you can expect is about an hour 15 minutes for the service today. Maybe an hour 20. Tim and I will do our best to uh, flag down Clay if he goes any longer. But uh, start out with some worship, uh, going to the offering, uh, prayer, and uh, message, and then followed up with a closing song. And uh, yeah, glad to see you guys. We'll hand it off to the band. Yay, Jimmy. Yeah, Please stand with us in worship.
Father God, I just thank you so much for today. I thank you for being you. Awesome. Powerful. I pray that our worship this morning was pleasing to your ear. It may not just be in the songs that we do, Lord, but in our, our everyday life. May we just strive to give you all of the glory, Lord. I lift up all the people in our church to you, Lord Jesus. I pray for the people who are sick, the people who are hurting. I thank you for all the, the good things and, and the triumphs. Father God, may you just live gloriously through our life. May we just seek you and lift your name on high. I pray that you're with Pastor Clay this morning as he preaches. May it be your words and not his. Just bless our time together. Amen. And if you want to turn around and give high fives, hugs, and free one another. <laughs> Thank you. 
good to see you this nice rainy spring morning. Uh, we also want to, on behalf of the church staff and leadership of the NAS, wish all of the moms a happy Mother's Day. Uh, we realize that uh, this, uh, this particular holiday can be a little bit bittersweet just based on life circumstances and, and things that, uh, in, that we encounter in our lives that pertains to moms and, and being a mother. And we want to acknowledge that. And we also just want to acknowledge all of you moms and just say thank you for the investment that you make in our lives. Uh, you are greatly loved. You greatly appreciated. And we just hope that you feel celebrated today uh, with your family. Uh, before we jump into the sermon today, we have a uh, special opportunity to, oh, he's just so cute, um, to uh, baptize Hunter Jordan Blado. So I'm going to ask Kyle and Sarah to come forward and the godparents and just have you guys just stand front and center right here. You can face me. You don't have to turn out and face anybody else. Oh, my goodness. And uh, this, is always, this is always just a highlight uh, for me. Um, but I know it's also a highlight in the lives of, of these families that come. And, and in, in bringing the culture um, to the Lord, you guys are just basically asking two things. One, that he would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That at some point in his life, he would come to a spot where he surrenders his life to Jesus as his Lord and as his Savior. Yes. Super smiley. And you are also just acknowledging that you are seeking God's direction in raising him to make that decision. And one of the, the passages that is so powerful for us uh, when it comes to this is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your heart. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. This passage tells us a couple things. First, is that you as parents are to love God first. That for you as an individual, as a husband, as a wife, um, as a mother, and as a father, your number one priority is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the life that you model in front of Hunter will serve as such a tremendous example for him to have that kind of relationship. The second thing that it teaches us is that the primary responsibility of teaching him the ways of God falls to you. We as a church are here to partner with you, and we say this every time. In any given year, we may have 50 to 100 hours with Hunter. You as his parents will have 10 to upwards of 15,000 hours every year to influence him. There is nobody who will have that kind of influence on his life to lead him to become a Christian and surrender his life to Jesus. So I have just a couple questions for you as parents and then a couple questions to the family and the godparents as well. So to you, Kyle and Sarah, do you promise in the presence of God, your friends and family, to do your best to provide Hunter with a Christian home of love and peace? Do you promise to do your best to instill in him the values and teaching that will lead him to a personal relationship with Jesus? And do you promise to pray daily for him? And do you also promise to entrust him to God's care and offer him to God to his service? If so, say we do. And then to the family and the godparents, so that Hunter may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers, do you vow, by God's help, to uphold Kyle and Sarah in prayer, to commit your time, resources, and encouragement to assist him <coughs> in raising Hunter in such a way that he can come to a personal relationship with Jesus? If so, answer, we do. Come see me. Uh, you guys can't see it. He's just been smiling the entire time. Making a hard Church body, 
we commit him to you and to your service, that you would have your way in his life. And we pray for Kyle and Sarah, Lord, that you would empower them to love you, that you would empower them to be the parents that you want for them to be to this young man. And we just look forward, Lord, to giving you glory for what you will do in and through his life. Thank you so much for this opportunity. We love you, we thank you, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we have just a few things for you, and Dad, we're going to hand them all to you. This is the rose um, that we use, and here's the petal. And the significance of the white rose is just God's pure love for the both of you and for him. And this is for you. You can take the rose and do whatever you would like with it, but it's not only just a symbol of God's love for you, but your love for him, because there really is no one who will love him like you will and influence him in such a, a powerful way. And for Dad, we have uh, his Bible and his certificate of baptism. We'll give those to you as well. And you being the man of the home, you uh, you help lead him in a direction toward Jesus. So we're just giving you a few resources, a few little books. Faith begins at home for Dad and faith begins at home for Mom. So you can begin instilling in him at the right age, at the appropriate age, what it means to love so thank you so much for letting us share this opportunity. Would you just turn and face everyone? And would you guys welcome them and, and uh, give them a round of applause? Short 
on love. Uh, they just had these high standards, but they didn't do a good job of loving people. And so, so God, Jesus tells them, remember what it was like when you first followed me. Remember the joy and the peace that you had and the life change. And, and I want you to repent from, from the life that you are living now. It is not a life of love. And I want you to return to the things that you did at first to help fan that flame of love in your heart for me. The second church we looked at was the church in Smyrna. Smyrna was under intense persecution pretty much in every dynamic of life. Religiously, socially, politically, in, in every environment, they were being pressed in on all sides. And Jesus tells them, do not fear. Based on your circumstances, it would be easy to be afraid of man and what they can do to you and what they are doing to you. But I want you to remember that I have overcome the world. I, your reward is going to be in heaven. And there's a great reward for, for standing up to and being faithful in the midst of this persecution. Don't be afraid. Just trust in me. Last week we looked at the church in Pergamum, which lit, they were in a, in a tremendously perverse religious culture. And, and they were being bombarded from, from all sides into compromise. They were being lured into sexual immorality and idolatry. And, and it was just, culture was constantly, constantly speaking into their lives and trying to get them to compromise their faith. And that's, that's what we talked about. We, we introed the whole thing by just talking about the nature of compromise. And typically, compromise isn't one of those things where you just take a flying leap off the stage. It's usually just one small step away from our core beliefs. One small step from our values. One small step from really what we hold dear. And, and in the process, we, we lull ourselves into, into a sense of safety. Like, I, I probably shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. And you kind of think, okay, well, I did it, and it wasn't that bad. It was kind of fun. And so we get kind of used to it and think, well, okay, maybe I can just take one more little step. And, and we just get this false sense of security that everything is okay. The truth is, many of us, through compromising, have found ourselves with a destructive habit, Maybe even in a lifestyle that years ago we never would have dreamt or never would have wanted for our lives. Many of us, through compromise, have hearts and lives that are full of anger and bitterness and rage because of something that's happened. And we walked down the path of unforgiveness. Instead of following what Jesus wanted us to do, we compromised and we held on to bitterness. Some of us found some things online that we like to look at that aren't appropriate. And we just thought, well, just one more look, and just one more little step, and now it consumes us. And it's very hard to go throughout the day without maybe searching on our phone or looking online at things we have no business looking at. Some of us early on in dating relationships started crossing the line Physically, We started compromising our beliefs and our values, and, and it cost us. And, and we find ourselves in the midst of a promiscuous lifestyle, and we're just going beyond what we ever thought we would go. And if we could go back and undo those first two or three steps of compromise, we absolutely would. See, in our times of, of compromise, we actually encounter one thing that fuels or, or speeds up or accelerates our downfall. And it is so subtle, we oftentimes don't realize that compromise has, has led us to this, or even that this is a part of our lives. And it's a very indistinct decision that we make, but it has incredibly distinct ramifications and consequences for our lives. When we're tempted to compromise, that temptation usually comes from an outside source. It usually comes from an influence outside of us, whether it's our peers, you know, someone in our family that is telling us to do something wrong, whether it's we see something, a message from the media, it's that one glance online, but it, it comes from outside of us. And, and initially, when we're confronted with that, our conscience will light up or starts waving a warning flag. Don't go there. Don't step in that direction. Don't even consider it. But we do, and we take that one step, and we realize once we take a few more steps into this compromise, our conscience all of a sudden becomes suddenly quiet. 
In other words, we have pushed that voice down, and we don't really listen to it anymore. And once we've stepped into those two or three steps of compromise, we're faced with a choice. Do I pull back the reins on this thing and turn around and go back to what I know is right, or am I going to keep stepping in this direction? Am I going to turn around, or am I going to keep, or am I going to keep stepping? And sometimes we just choose to keep stepping. One more look isn't going to hurt. One more time. One more night. One more event. One more drink. Whatever. One more isn't going to hurt. And so we just keep going. When we compromise to sin, here's what pops up in our life. Tolerating sin. It's one thing to compromise to sin, but it's a completely other thing to tolerate sin, to allow sin, to permit sin in our hearts. Because tolerating sin doesn't come from out there somewhere. Tolerating sin is an internal choice. It comes from inside of us. It's a decision that we make. And when we permit sin, when we grant ourselves permission to, to, to let it reside in us, it gives us permission to participate in sin. And instead of pulling back the reins and turning around, we just keep on going. And when we do, we offer sin free rent in the homes of our hearts. And, and I just wrote that the, the cycle usually goes like this. When we compromise to sin, it leads to tolerating sin. It, it leads to just allowing it to, to sit there and reside. And once we allow it to sit here, we give ourselves permission to participate. To jump in and just go with it. This is the issue in the church at Thyatira. This is the issue that Jesus is addressing with this particular group of believers. And the question that we need to ask is how do we as individuals, how do we as a church, live intentionally so that we aren't tolerating or even compromising and participating in sin? What does Jesus say to them as the remedy for this <coughs> equation. Well, let's let's jump into this. Let me give you a little bit of background on, on Thyatira first. There, there really is nothing glamorous about the city of Thyatira. It, the, in, in the cities that we've looked at previously, some of them are these major religious centers, big cultural centers, all of these grand temples and libraries and all of this stuff. Thyatira is just an average city. And in fact, it's the smallest city of all of the seven which are addressed. And geographically, it's located in a valley which leads to the city of Pergamum. There is no natural defense um, for the city of Thyatira. They're not up on a hill. They're, they're very susceptible to, to the invasion of foreign armies. And in fact, for, for centuries, their history was, was a, just this series of being conquered, the city's destroyed, and then it's built up again. They're conquered by another army, the city's destroyed, it's built up again. And just on and on and on and on. And about 130, 140 BC, Rome finally conquers the area. And for the first time in centuries, there is peace in Thyatira. They finally have some stable footing and can go along with life. The one thing that Thyatira was known for, a couple things actually, was this very expensive purple dye that was used in the materials and the fabrics that they would make. And there was such a, they were of such good quality, there was a high demand for this material and for this dye. And so that was kind of what they were known for. That was their, that was their business and, and that's what kept them going. And it's to the people who live in this city that Jesus addresses. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, this is what Jesus tells John, the disciple, who's writing this letter down. This is what Jesus tells John to write to these believers. So verse 18, it says, To the angel, or the messenger, of the church in Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. This is incredibly important. This is the only time in the book of Revelation that Jesus is referred to as the Son of God. Most of the time, when Jesus refers to himself, he refers to himself as the Son of Man, which is a title that he gave himself to help 
identify himself with humanity, that he had taken on flesh and blood, that he ate and slept and drank and got bruises and all of those stuff, just like we do, and he became like us. He became one of us. He knows what it's like to become human. But Jesus is saying here, this is the words, these are the words of the Son of God. This is the title he is giving himself. I'm not coming to you in my humanity. I'm coming to you in the power and authority of my divinity. I'm coming to you as the Son of God. And that's going to play into the words that he says. And he says his words are like, bla or his eyes are like blazing fire. It's a piercing gaze. He's not fooled by the veneers and the facades and the outward actions of mankind. He sees right through. He sees right to the heart, right to the motives, the inclinations, the intentions of man. There's nothing that escapes his knowing gaze. And it says his feet are like burnished bronze. In other words, he's steadfast and immovable. And, and his judgments are clear and accurate. And they're not going to change. The picture Jesus is painting for these people is that, yes, this is going to be a message of, of grace and mercy, but what is going to accompany that message is a message of righteous judgment. It's both. And so he starts off in verse 19. This is where our phrase, be comforted, comes in. Revelation 2, verse 19. Jesus says to them, I know your deeds, your faith, and your love your service and perseverance, and that you are doing more than you did at first. It, there are a lot of good things going on and taking place in the life of this church. He admires their faith. The deeds that they do are, are motivated by love and motivated by their faith in Jesus. One author says that you know, their, their undying love for Jesus led to their service, and their faith and faithfulness to God led to their perseverance. Jesus admires that. that. You're doing more than you did at first. You're growing. You're reaching people. You're vibrant. You're alive. People who are far from God are, are finding a place of acceptance and finding a place of, of deliverance and, and a place where they belong. I admire that. That's good. The first church we looked at was Ephesus. And we said they're long on morality but short on love. This church is the opposite. Love people, very friendly, super kind, but very short on their morals. And here's where Jesus warns them. Verse, uh, verse 20. Jesus says to them, Nevertheless, in spite of what I just said, and as good as that is, what I'm about to say trumps that. <laughs> Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate, you permit, you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Okay, get a little background on this. In in Thyatira, if, if you wanted a job, or if you, per, if you uh, practice a particular trade, whether it be carpentry, or worked in the, you know, worked with the material, or the purple dye, whatever it was, if you wanted a job, or had a particular trade, you were forced to join a guild, or a union, this association of, of men who worked in the same field, worked in the same trade as you. And these, these guilds wielded tremendous amounts of power. They they were able to determine who got jobs. They were able to kind of determine what jobs were available. And not only were they uh, work-related, they were kind of, in a sense, a religious organization as well. Because every guild adopted or developed a certain god that they worshipped. And, and through these lavish feasts, horrible worship practices that oftentimes included sexual sin... Um, all of these sacrifices made to this God in order that this God would bless their trade, that he would bless their business. And as a member of this guild, you were forced to participate in these practices. And if you refused to, you were excluded and oftentimes lost your job because you refused to participate. Early Christians 
would not participate in those because their only allegiance was given to Jesus Christ. I'm not giving my allegiance to this God that you made up. I'm not participating in that. And so they are now in this dilemma. How do I keep my job? How do I have an income? How do I support myself and my family and be a Christian at the same time? How do I make this work economically and how do I make this work religiously? Because as I see it, these two can't be combined. And so they were in a bind. They didn't know how to navigate that. Now, within the church in Thyatira, this woman named Jezebel, which most scholars, they believe it was an actual, an actual person, an actual woman, but they don't think her name was Jezebel. He uses the name Jezebel as a reference to the woman in the Old Testament um, who was married to King Ahab, Ahab sorry, and led the nation of Israel into sin. She was manipulative, heartless. She drove, between the two of them, they drove the nation into one of the worst places morally that the nation of Israel had ever been. And, and Jesus uses this phrase, Jezebel, because he's mislead, she is misleading her people. And here's what she is teaching. She is giving them permission to participate in this idolatry, to participate in the sexual sin, to participate in the feast in the name of this God, and participate in Christian worship of Jesus alone. She said, you can do both. You can participate in this and do this at the same time. Yeah, I, know, I know it seems like a struggle, but, you know, one of the popular beliefs at that time was your body will be changed in, in heaven. So your physical body doesn't matter. So go ahead and participate in that. But you can be a Christian at the same time. She is teaching that you can live a double life in a place of authority inside the church. This is not Pergamum where outside voices are trying to influence you away. This is a negative, sinful voice inside the church leading God's people astray. Sunday Christians have been around for a long, long time. The issue is not Sunday Christians. The issue is the person in authority teaching them that that kind of lifestyle is okay. You can do all of that. In the name of Jesus. And Jesus says, you're tolerating that. Why are you allowing that? You are tolerating, you're permitting and allowing her teaching in the assembly of my people. You're, you're tolerating false teaching. You're tolerating the evils of idolatry and giving yourself to these so-called gods and offering sacrifices and giving your allegiance to these gods. You're tolerating the, the evils of sexual sin committed in the name of Jesus. This is ridiculous. You are you're tolerating certain people in the church advocating the very lifestyle that Jesus despised and delivered you from. Some serious words. And in verse 21 through 23, he's, Jesus says about her, I have given her time to repent of her immorality. But she is unwilling. So I will cast, on her, cast her on a bed of suffering. And I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. So tell us how you really feel, Jesus. <laughs> but within this statement, and as harsh as these words are, you really do see the grace and mercy of Jesus in the midst of that sin, in the midst of what's going on. God is merciful. He is patient. He is unwilling that any should perish. He's gracious and slow to anger. Because he says, I have given her time. I have given her opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. I have extended grace to her. And I'm not withdrawing it, but she is unwilling to change. She's unwilling to give up her ways. And because she is, she's going to face the consequences. She's unwilling to repent. And the pride, the power, the prestige that she gains from having this voice, from having this influence, is too much and too important for her to give up. And because she refuses, Jesus says, she will suffer for her deeds, and she will suffer for her teaching. Those will not go unpunished. And anybody who follows along with her and follows these teachings, which you know are wrong, you're going to suffer the same 
consequences. And he says that statement that I will strike her children dead. Most of the scholars that, that I read don't feel like this is an actual, like he's going to strike <laughs> them. But this is, a, this is a, a picture that I'm not going to allow another generation of my people to be deceived into following this teaching. In other words, he's saying, this ends now. I will not allow it to continue. And Jesus calls his followers his bride. And it's almost like Jesus is saying, I'm not going to allow my bride to be lured into adulterous relationships on my watch. I will not allow her gown to be stained and led astray. The only way this is going to be made right is if you repent. If you turn around and leave what you're doing and come back to me. This is the only way it's going to be made right. The rest of, of verse 23 says, Then all the churches will know. Not just your church. Everybody is going to know. You're going to serve as the example. All the churches are going to know that I will make... Whoops, sorry, I skipped a verse. That I am he who searches the hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. The message that he is trying to get across is, look, you cannot deceive me, you can't hide from me, you can't manipulate me. I know what is going on. I mean, make no mistake, God cannot be mocked. You and I will reap what we sow. And he will repay each of us according to our deeds. Now, let's clarify. Our salvation, our redemption is secured by grace through faith alone. But our deeds matter. In fact, James says that our faith without works is dead. Our works reveal the authenticity of our faith. Jesus, I believe it's in Matthew 18, when he separated the sheep and the goats, rewards those who do the small things, excuse me, who do the small things for people, because it's as though people are doing small things to him and for him. Our deeds matter. Verse 24. Jesus says, Now, I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, just a reference to the, the stuff that she's teaching, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. And here we see the, the grace and the mercy of Jesus on full display for those who truly trusted him and who remain faithful to him. And he goes, I, I'm not going to impose any other burden on you. Now, imagine you are, you're, you're the pastor of, of this church. And, and what we know of Revelation, it was written on a scroll, and all of this was written down. And once it was, it was passed around to the seven churches. There weren't seven individual letters that went out. Everybody saw this. And so imagine you're the pastor here in Smyrna, and you catch word that the scroll is, is arriving, and, and you are super excited. I mean, this is from John. This is from one of Jesus' closest disciples, and this is going to be great. I cannot wait to see what he has to say. This is going to be awesome. And it shows up in your hands, and you're like, okay, guys, get everybody you know, everybody that's in the church, and gather them around. So we're going to get into one room, we're going to hear all of this. And you can just sense the anticipation. What is he going to say? And so the pastor opens up the scroll and he says, uh, you know, I see your deeds. I, I see your love and your faith, your service and your perseverance. And they're like, yes, I know. Well, we've got some good things going on. You're like, fist bump, dude. No, you know, and it, it's awesome. And, and as, as he's reading it aloud for the first time for everybody, he just kind of pauses. And he looks up. Nevertheless, this is what I have against you. You tolerate someone in your midst who's put themselves in a position of authority 
You tolerate them leading you into idolatry. Leading you into sacrificing and giving yourself to other gods. You allow someone to lead you into the sexually immoral lifestyle that you had before I delivered you, that I delivered you out of. You're going back to it. You tolerate this woman, Jezebel. And when he said that name, everyone knew who that person was in the room. And anybody who follows her is going to face the same consequences that she does. <coughs> and it was about like that. You could hear him drop. Because now everybody knows that everybody knows what is going on. Our sin has been laid bare. God knows and we are accountable. God knows and we are accountable. Imagine if you are one of this small group of believers that through the midst of all of that, you have remained true to Jesus. You've not strayed. You, you've sat through and you've listened to what she says and it just, it's so revolted. The friends and the family that, that you've seen come to Christ are now turning away from Christ. And it is heartbreaking and it is devastating to watch them throw their lives away. Imagine you're part of this small group can you imagine what that was like to watch those people walk away? That is a massive burden. To endure and listen to teaching that you know is false, teaching that you know is leading people back into sin, people whom you love and care about. And it's all for nothing. That is a massive burden to carry. And Jesus says, I know what you're going through. I, I affirm your situation, and I'm not going to put anything else on you, because I know this is a big load to carry. I'm not asking anything more of you. The one thing I'm going to encourage you to do is hold on. Hold on to what you have until I come. Clinch that fist, hold on tight, and know in the midst of you holding on, I am holding you. And I'm not going to let you go. Hang on tight. And really, all they had to hang on to, all that was left for them, was to simply hang on to Jesus. To hang on to what they knew was true and what they knew was right. On the screen is a picture of an Asian longhorn beetle. <coughs> Cute, huh? <laughs> it's actually really gross. Um, Asian longhorn beetles are unique in that the females, when they find a tree, oh, well, they actually live in trees, they will lay upwards of 80 to 90 eggs somewhere on the bark of a particular tree. When the eggs hatch and the larvae come out, they, the, the tiny little larvae start eating their way into the trunk of the tree. And they get into certain ways and they begin to grow and they begin to develop and get bigger. And as they do, they turn back around and start eating a hole back out. To the point that by the time they reach the bark again, they are a full-sized adult. And they leave holes in trees about the size of a dime, sometimes the size of a nickel. This is what an infestation looks like. <coughs> and so one female lays 80 eggs, and then the females from that one lay another 80 eggs, and on and on and on until the tree looks like this. And eventually, those beetles will kill that tree from the inside out. Isn't that what tolerating sin does to us? We compromise once or twice. It's just a small little thing. But you compromise one or two times. And it's just a tiny little thing that burrows down into the meat of your heart. And then you tolerate it. And you allow it to sit there. And you permit it to reside. And all of a sudden, it turns around and it starts coming out in your words, in your actions, in your behaviors. And sin kills us from the inside out. 
And that is what Jesus takes issue with in his church. Sin is killing you from the inside out. If there's one thing Jesus would say is that sin is serious. He doesn't take sin lightly. And then some of us are going to push back and we're going to say, well, I, okay, I guess sin is serious, but isn't God forgiving? Isn't God loving? Isn't God merciful? I mean, I don't understand why he gets so riled up about sin and why he comes across so forcefully. I, I don't understand why he responds that way if he's so forgiving and, and loving. And I guess my, my response to that would be then, then we don't fully understand the full character of a holy and righteous God. We don't understand the, the full nature of a righteous and holy God because sin is what separates us in relationship from Him. By our very nature, because we are sinful people, we are subject to God's wrath. And sin costs our Heavenly Father the life of His Son. Sin is serious. Well, but, but I mean, I'm, I don't do bad things. I'm a good person. You know, I'm nice to people. I open doors for the ladies. I, you know, I, I, I'm gentle with people. I don't get angry. I do good things. I, I, I'm just a good person. There were good things in the church at Thyatira. But tolerating sin destroyed it. This letter was written in AD 95 end of the first century. By the end of the second century, many historians say that the church in Thyatira ceased to exist. Gone. Because sin and tolerating sin killed it from the inside out. So the question for you and I as we begin to wrap up is, is just this. <coughs> What sin do you tolerate in your life right now? What sin do you tolerate and allow and permit in your life right now? And some of us are going to say, well, you know, it, it's just a little thing. It doesn't, I, it, you know, I don't do it very often. Nobody really knows. And I'm not like that around people. Some of us will even say, well, everyone else around me does it. And they call themselves a Christian. All of those phrases are indicative of the fact that we are tolerating something that is not pleasing to God. It probably started as a few small steps. <coughs> But we allow it. What sin do you tolerate in your life right now? And not just the, the outward sinful behaviors, but, but the small little attitudes, the small sinful things which drive those behaviors. Is it pride, judgment, lust, greed? What do you tolerate? And, and the second question is, who are you listening to? Who is influencing you that is advocating that sin in your life? That instead of calling it out in your life, is actually encouraging it to continue? Who is advocating and influencing you to tolerate that sin? Eventually, sin is going to catch up with us. It always does. And sin is contagious. Sin spreads. It has no cure. No cure outside of the saving grace of Jesus Christ crucified. None. The wonderful thing about God, through His Son Jesus, is He is giving us time. He's giving us an opportunity to turn. He's giving us an opportunity to change our ways. To say that little thing that you don't think is a big deal is slowly turning into a big deal. And it's going to destroy you. Would you surrender that to me? And would you turn your life back over to me?
the furthest sinner from God is not out of his reach nor out of his desire to save. It's all of us. In our prayer time this morning before service started, someone mentioned Isaiah 55 verses 6 through 7. I just thought it was so appropriate that we kind of wind down. And it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found, while you still have time. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. Let them turn to our God for he will freely and abundantly pardon. What an incredible promise for those of us that may be tolerating sin, that may even be participating in sin and call ourselves free. But there's grace and mercy if we turn to God and he will fully and completely and freely pardon through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus finishes with verse 26 through 29 in Revelation 2. He says, To those who are victorious and do my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give them the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The promise for those who overcome is that when Jesus returns, we will reign with him in heaven. And Jesus became one of us. He humbled himself to the form of a servant, even to obedience to death on a cross. And it says that Jesus, or that God exalted him now and he's seated at the right hand of the Heavenly Father. And we participate in his reign as king of kings. And he says, I will give you the morning star, which is just basically, it's a reference to himself. And he says, I will give you the fullness of of my presence forever. Sin will no longer have a say. Sin will no longer play a role. You will have the fullness of my presence forever. What sin do you tolerate? And what do you need to hold on to? Do you just need to hold on that much tighter to Jesus because you tolerate and are participating in sin? Do you buy your head? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this powerful truth of your word. I thank you, God, that you are a God who is righteous, that you are a God who is holy, that you are a God who proclaims truth to us. And, and you, you love us enough to be able to say, yes, there are good things in your life, but here are some areas where you need to work on. And for some of us, that area is tolerating and permitting and allowing sin in our hearts. And I thank you that you are just and righteous enough to be able to call that out in us. But I also thank you that you are merciful and graceful enough and, and love us enough to say, I will bear that sin on the cross. That if you trust me as the payment for that sin, and if you repent and turn your life over to me and turn to me, I will forgive you, and I will empower you, and I will give you the gift of my spirit that will help you and, and, and inform your conscience as to when you're beginning to compromise and when you're beginning to tolerate sin, I will let you know, and I will empower you to be victorious over sin. I thank you that God, you're a God of judgment and righteousness and holiness and a God of grace and mercy as well. And God, wherever we are with you, whatever decision we need to make today, whatever we need to confess and surrender to you, would we do that in these few moments that we have together? I thank you, God, for speaking to us in such a powerful, powerful way through your word. We love you. We pray all of these things in your name. Amen. We're going to sing one more song as we close. We invite you to stand with us. The band's going to lead us in one more song. When the song is over, uh, as we dismiss, there will be people up here at the front. They are willing to pray for you, pray with you if you have anything that you would like to pray about. Um, but let's uh, let's worship together um, our Lord and Savior. <laughs> Yeah.